introduction. Uh, this is a post-secondary conference, but uh, in order to make sure that the post-secondary issues are ripe for discussion, we need to focus a little on the K-12 issues as well. Uh, those of you who got to hear Walt Mossberg, he raised this issue, which is all the rage now in K-12, about critical or higher order thinking. And a lot of people say to me, well, what is critical thinking about? And the best illustration I ever saw of this was a natural one, spontaneous, is by Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles, who ran the Simpson Bowles Commission for President Obama. And they always start with each telling an anecdote. And Simpson tells the one about, he's from Wyoming, about a guy in Wyoming who's awakened in the middle of the night by a phone call. And he gets on the phone and he picks it up and he says, well, how the hell should I know? That's almost 2,000 miles from here. And his wife leans over and he said, what was that about? And he said, I don't know, some idiot calling to ask if the coast is clear. And you see, that's a guy who doesn't get higher order thinking. And Bowles, on the other hand, tells a story about his aunt in North Carolina, a small town. And when her husband died, Basically, she called the local newspaper and started to dictate a 2,000-word obituary. And in the middle of it, the guy said, basically to him, he said, well, listen, I'd be happy to print this, but I should tell you we have a new policy we charge by the word. At which point she said, well, if that's the case, just put Herman died. And he said, well, that's fine, but I should also tell you we have a minimum uh, charge for five words. She thought for a second, she said, Herman died, Buick for sale. See, that's a, woman, that's a woman who gets higher order thinking. So the question is, can we get all our kids to where that North Carolina woman is? So what I'd like to focus on today, really, and talk to you a little bit about Amplify and some of the exciting things. This was designed as a new business that was intentionally going to be disruptive in K-12 at News Corporation. And we're going to focus on those issues. I want to show you some of the things we're doing. But I want to put it in a larger context of what's going on in K-12, having spent almost a decade in New York City dealing with these issues. And, you know, Walt Mossberg said, and I agree, I, the major challenge in post-secondary in our colleges and universities is really the issue of cost. Still today, for all the other issues, our universities and colleges are recognized as the best in the world. To learn about K-12, they learn post-secondary. So, to me, the issue is really so fundamental. If we had an honest high school graduation rate in America, measuring college readiness the way they do at the college board and elsewhere, we would be talking about a third or at most 40% of our kids. And that is not a long-term winning formula. So this is not just about cost. This is really about the kind of people who will be in the future. And Amplify hopes to play a big role in all of that. So let me start with what I hope is a bold <coughs> assertion that we can agree on, which is starting now digital technology will forever change the way we educate students. And I really believe that's going to happen. It's not going to happen overnight, but it is going to happen. Now the first question is, why should we change the way? And I think this is pretty old hat, but I want to go through it quickly for you, because I think people really don't realize what's happened in the last 30, 40 years. We're investing more, but we're simply not seeing the results. If education were a business, they would have shut it down long ago in America. Let me just show you two sharp charts that make this point. This chart graphs in constant dollars what we spend on K-12. And it shows that from 1970 to 2008, 40 year period essentially, we've more than doubled our real dollar spend. And then if you look at the bottom, it also shows the national reading scores on the NAEP. And the NAEP is considered the gold standard. And those are high school kids, which is obviously the most relevant measure. In the lower grades, there's been some improvement, but it doesn't endure through high school, which is when it's got to endure. So basically, what we have is a broken business model. We're pouring money into this, but we're not getting results. And another way to look at it is to look at it in con connection with the rest of the world. You know, in 1970, we didn't live in the global economy that we live in now. So America's kids are now competing in an entirely different environment. And if you look at that picture, you see the same picture. We're outspending everybody else if you look on the left side of this thing. But we're not outperforming most of the countries. I mean, so we're toward the bottom in that group and significantly behind places like Finland and Korea and even Japan and Canada in performance. So those are 30, 40, 50 points. So the model is broken and that's why we need to think about not just how we invest, but how we change the delivery of the basic service. If we don't, 
I'm pretty sure we're going to continue to see these results, and that's going to, as I say, impact the kind of society we have. Now, somebody made this on the last panel, made this point. In every other area of our lives, we've seen dramatic changes, but schools haven't. They basically have stayed static and resistant to <coughs> all kinds of change. I mean, that's a classroom in 1900. That's a classroom in 1940. This is one in 1960. And here's other than some are in black and white, the others in color. Basically, it's one teacher, 28 kids, 9 to 3 in the afternoon, and 1,500 square feet. The delivery system has really remained fixed and dramatically resisted the kinds of innovation that take place in the rest of the world. Now, we could debate forever what the problems are, but the basic issue, if I convince you of nothing else, we really need to change for the, in order to make sure that the next generation is better served than now. Right now, in places like New York, Chicago, Boston, and elsewhere, there are kids in the third grade we know are not going to be college ready in 10 or 12 years when they graduate from high school, if they graduate from high school. And so we have got to think collectively about a different delivery model. And one in which three core ideas, I believe, have to be integrated. First of all, we've got to be smart. All of you who are dealing with big data in all sorts of areas, education, we can learn. We can actually target the individual kids. Second of all, we've got to move to a much more personalized. This one teacher, 28 kids, trying to teach to the middle of a class is a broken delivery system model. We can use curriculum in order to personalize and customize. And the third thing is, we can extend the day, extend the year, and get a whole hell of a lot smarter by using mobile devices. I, I read all the time, just yesterday, the governor of New York and his state of the state talked about we need more and better education. One way to get us there that's realistic is to start to think about a new delivery model, one that relies on mobile devices in an entirely different so that's the basic premise. Now the question, I said, why do we need to do this? Why do we want to start now? You know, a lot of people said to me, well, we went through this 10 years ago. A lot of people in this room were involved 10 years ago. We're going to have to, let's see, a few people nodding, you know. And some guy up here like me was saying, starting now, we're going to have this. And, you know, we gave everybody a PC in schools. And at least when I arrived in New York in 2002, a lot of those PCs were still locked in boxes in the basement. This is not about device. If people think this is about device, they miss it. This is about transforming the education and delivery system in a big way. Now, why do I think that can happen now? Because this is a highly resistant uh, delivery system. And I think there are four converging factors that are critical to this discussion and give me great optimism for why now. The first is the common core standards. Most of you know about it, but essentially we now have 45 of our states and DC come together to adopt identical standards. And the thing that's critical about that, and there are two testing consortia that are coming in behind it that those 45 states will align with. What that will mean is that will drive the systems. And there are two things about Common Core. One, that they're common, and second of all, that they're core. That it's going to change the way we do business. The fact that they're common means now if you're writing content, you can write across all of those states that are in ours. But the more important part, I think, is that they're different. That the core standards are designed to really implement a very different curriculum experience. That's going to mean the new content that's coming is going to have to be very different. Those people who simply rechunk up what they had before and put it into the market and say this is aligned with Common Core are not going to get the job done. You're going to have to develop content that gets kids deeply immersed in a very different kind of educational experience. That higher order thinking I was talking about, kids' ability to write, to understand complex texts, to work collectively, those skills are going to be critical. So the fact that this is happening in 2014 is going to be a big driver. If you look at what happened in Kentucky, they did the testing aligned with Common Core, and they almost had the number of kids who were proficient in performance. That's going to happen in those 45 states. That will be America's wake-up call. And for the first time, we'll stop making play pretend and actually realize that we're not serving our kids. Huge driver in the system. This market, this integrated market for the first time, we're talking about an almost $700 billion market. But once you have this integrated market 
in K-12 where people can start to look at writing for a national market, I think that's going to change the dynamics of the education market significantly. Second reason to start now, big point about resistance. Things don't work in K-12 unless teachers embrace it. And one of the things you're seeing now is a huge change in our teaching force, one that I think will be conducive to it. Look at these numbers from 1998. What we're seeing simultaneously is a greening and a greening of K-12. So where it used to be the number of 50 plus year old teachers were down 23%, now it's 40%. And on the other hand, those with relatively little experience has grown. We anticipate, based on retirement projections, that in the next three to four years, we could lose as much as a third percent of our current workforce. So we're going to be hiring new millennial teachers, and through all the surveys and analysis, we know that they're much more conducive to a technology-driven world. After all, they grew up in a world that's very different from the ones that I grew up in. So I think that's a powerful force and an encouraging force for change. Third thing, the economics of K-12 are changing. When I showed you those graphs about the great growth, that growth is now flatlined overall. And going forward, because of health care and pension and other responsibilities, school districts have got to think differently about the way they're focusing in K-12 and how they're spending money. And that, I think, will ask them to focus on productivity issues they haven't focused on. Already, you see states getting into this space, looking at, as I'll talk about, blended models. Federal government just did race to the top of the Department of Education and took 16 different school districts on personalized learning, driving a new paradigm, using different models and, and using tablets and computers and so forth. And they just awarded 16 states somewhere on average of 25, 30 million dollars each. So this is starting to move into the DNA of the school system and being intelligently incentivized. Right now in a survey that we did at Amplify, 70% of the top 20 school districts already indicated that they want to rethink their delivery system, look more to blended models, more integrated models, and highly personalized learning. Interesting study that was done, people say, well, how are we going to afford this? One way to afford this is to think about the mix of human and technological capital in a very different and much more intelligent way. After all, the thing we want to achieve is world-class instruction. And in any other field, we've learned to understand that if you don't maximize both your human capital and your technological inputs, you're not going to get there. In a study that was done by the Parthenon Group, it's very interesting, it showed that a blended model could actually save you over $1,000 on a $10,000 per student cost in order to deliver effective educational services. So I think this is not only more effective, but a more efficient delivery system, and I think schools will come to realize that. And then finally, as Walter and other, I mean, nobody would have predicted three years ago what's going on in mobile hardware costs. I mean, for the first time, when I was a chancellor, you know, we had computer labs and stuff, but it made it seem like some boutique one-off thing. I'm talking about creating an entirely different learning experience using one-to-one -one computing to extend a day, extend a year, engage kids in an entirely different way. And indeed, if the kid has his or her own device, for the first time you can constantly get smarter and smarter about the kids' work. It's just not just Amazon and Google that are getting smarter and smarter. We in K-12 need to do it. In one way, this device will tell you the things they click on, the games they like to play, the curriculum they find engaging. And that will create a positive feedback loop, just like in any other area of our society and economy. So those four factors, if you look at the average cost, I actually think that these are projections that uh, were done by one of the analysts, but I actually think it's going to come down more quickly to a $200, $250 price point for mobile devices. And it's going to change the economics of the field and the, adapt the, the uh, adaptation in the school system. So that, of course, and why digital technology? I guess the obvious answer is because this is where kids are doing everything else. I mean, those of you who have kids, you know, you are a recent father. I mean, I'm sure your kids are already swiping the iPad, right? And it's asking for your password. Uh, and don't give it to them, because they know how to buy these kids at a very early age. So, but no, you know, the first thing, people say, well, why the hell should we, why is this? First thing, just as a practical matter, that's the way kids are engaging in an entirely different, much more intuitive kind of learning experience. 
And of course, we all have talked about this, the other industries that have benefited by this kind of approach. I mean, everything we do, communicating, we were talking in the last panel about newspapers, communications, healthcare, where you manage your finances. I mean, everything else has already made the leap, and education is going to have to do the same thing. And there are just a few illustrations of where it's all going on. The other good news is, as I suggested before, schools are demanding it already. You see this going on not far from here in uh, San Jose, California. You've got the rocket ship schools that we just featured on PBS with a blended model. You've got Carpe Diem in Arizona. More and more people, when I was in New York, we created a thing called the Innovation Zone. I saw it just the other day, Mayor Bloomberg doubled down on that. We created a thing called the School of One, highly personalized learning. So this is in the air and in the changing ethos of the K-12 system. And if you see recent studies, these are things that have been done by the federal government and analysis that they've done. Secretary Duncan and Julius Jankowski, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, have their own initiative. 90% of the states have gone into under the new Common Core, adopt online assessments. Almost 60% plan to expand the use of digital textbooks, 45% mobile devices. And this is projected for the next couple of years. Again, my prediction is that would be accelerated. But if simply that would happen, that would be transformative in terms of a K-12 system. And probably most important, early, all the early indications by the research out there is digital technology can improve, improve the learning experience. It seems pretty obvious, but on the three core things that matter, engagement. We have studied student engagement. And what you find is, and if students aren't engaged, I don't care how good the instruction is, it doesn't matter. In the end, when you think about a K-12 experience, it's what's coming toward a student. It could be from a teacher, it could be online, it could be from classmates, social networking, but what's coming in and how much is she absorbing? And so engagement is critical. Studies show that this increases engagement. Efficiency. Lots of kids can learn at different paces. When I went to the school of one, it was an eighth grade math class that was being taught. It was January 14th. And a kid was, I asked him, what are you working on? He said, I'm so glad you asked. I just started the ninth grade. Some kids can move at a very different pace. This enables us to personalize and customize. And finally, and probably most importantly, is performance. And my view is the company that can move those metrics is going to be the company that leads the disruption. And forgive me if I'm partial, but I think Amplify mm -hmm. is going to be at the forefront of that. And we're developing a suite of products that I now want to talk a few minutes about. And Lawrence Holt, our chief products officer, will demo them for you just to give you an idea of what I think. And remember, my view of this is that it's really going to change the service delivery system. It's not about hardware. In the end, it really is about the instructional experience, the way we do it, how we mix technological support along with human capital to get it done. So Amplify has got three divisions, and we think this is the platform that ultimately can provide the service delivery transformation. Amplify Insight are the data and the analytics, and we'll show you a little bit of that in a second, but basically, we want to get smarter. Wireless Generation, which is a company that News Corp bought when they went to the, into this space two years ago, is now servicing some three million kids throughout the United States. And what they're doing is bringing sophisticated analytics small soft bore assessments and building on that to differentiate, coming behind that with products that will help kids move forward at their own pace in a personalized, differentiated way. Access is our platform play. This is, and you'll hear a little bit about this. This is a tablet that we are designing, which we believe should be the operating system for K-12, to and it's essentially an integrated solution. It's not a tablet as we know it. It's not a tablet designed for the consumer market. It is an educational learning platform. We'll go into some of the qualities that it has. But this is something that's not just taken off the shelf and put in schools. This is not buying a PC or even a current uh, uh, tablet. This is really a learning experience that has key ingredients. It's integrated. It's designed for kids to take home. So it comes with uh, radio for 3G and 4G to deal with the equity issues for kids who don't have Wi-Fi. It comes with content, it comes with data and analytics, and it comes with software that enables the teacher to really control the user experience and 
integrated in a way that makes this a learning platform. And then the third division we have is Amplify Learning, which is basically our content, our curriculum that we're developing, and we believe it will be a very different, engaging, immersive, gamified experience for kids that will become reinforcing on the platform and with uh, the kind of data and analytics that drive it. The three of those things are complementary to each other, but school districts, some of them will want one, some of them will want two, and some of them will want three. Some of them will want our platform with other people's content, that's great. Some of them will want our content off other people's platform, that's great. But those three elements, data and analytics to drive increased knowledge and positive feedback loop, followed by a learning platform, a place where a kid and a school and a teacher can come together to transform the learning experience and rich and powerful and immersive content that enables kids to really engage and move in higher order thinking. So with that, let me just start with Amplify Insight and introduce you to Lawrence Holt, who's Chief Products Officer for many years before News Corp acquired Wireless Gen. He was at Wireless Gen. Lawrence, why don't you come up here and show them a little bit about that. Thanks, Joe. So, uh, first thing I want to show you is about Amplify Insight. Um, and this is trying to solve the problem of data and interpreting data in classrooms. There's already a lot of data collected in classrooms, but it tends to be in siloed systems. Teachers have a tough time getting to it. Even if they get to it, they then somehow got to synthesize it and understand what's going on. And we think if teachers can do that more easily, that itself could lead to a great change. So we've come up with this map idea. It's a product that's already in use in uh, several thousand classrooms across the country. Um, and let me show it to you. It basically works like Google Maps, uh, where each of the hexagons on this uh, map represent a learning goal, essentially a common core standard. So something that a student has to master, understand, know how to do, or a skill that they learn. And uh, we've laid them out as a progression. So this is a progression that goes from the bottom left of the screen to the top right. This is actually sixth grade. Um, we have all of, all of K-12, uh, and uh, in fact, up through AP. And uh, so the, really the task of the student and the teacher is to move from the bottom left to the top right and turn the whole thing green along the way. You do that, you're done. Uh, and obviously synthesize it and, and, uh, and test that along the way. So uh, red means we have overlaid data onto this map from a variety of, of sources that it's already being collected and new ones that show us that uh, this student has not mastered that learning goal. Green means they have. And I'm showing you here real data. We changed the names. But uh, you can see this is, a, this is actually a class level report. And you can see that there are, there's, there's some work to do. Uh, and in fact, if you zoom in uh, further with the map, then you actually can see this a little pie chart appears that shows us, in this case, uh, estimating area and volume. Actually, most of, that of the class is red, is still in need of some extra help to understand that. Uh, and then what we've done is link to the map um, resources. There's already a lot of content out there. It's a varying quality, and we're trying to solve that problem by bringing ratings and, and uh, floating the good stuff to the top. But videos, interactive objects, games, uh, teacher videos, professional development, all of that can be brought to bear around this specific learning goal. So it's right in the moment for the student or the teacher uh, to help them get to the next level and go back and turn that, turn that part of the map green. The new data is coming in all the time, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an active map. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to make sense of. Uh, we've already got about a billion plus data points behind this map. Uh, that we've collected, and so we're starting to be able to do the kind of analytics that Google and Facebook and others do, where we're looking at patterns, profiles of students, and pathways through the map. There's no one pathway across this map, and we can start to uh, predict where a student's going to be and what they should work on next. And I know there's some questions about this, but I think we're going to save them for, for the end, if that's okay. Back to you, John. All right, well, don't go anywhere because we're going to quickly move on to the next experience, which is the access experience. Now, think about what Lawrence just showed you, which is 
if you could say, Lawrence is very smart, so he would have all greens on his chart. Me, not so much. I would have quite a few reds up there. The teacher can now differentiate. She can drive him to algebra, while at the same time she's still teaching me fractions. And that's very important, because if you're teaching a class of 28, if you don't get that right, some kids are going to be slowed down unnecessarily, and other kids are going to get lost in the sauce. And so this is very powerful. Now, Access is the platform that we designed this on, which is really, uh, I believe, a true learning platform, integrated operating system for the K-12 space. Lawrence? I think there's a, if you just click one more, there's a. Yep. Thank you. <coughs> So let me tell you about Amplify Access. What we've done, this is basically a tailored Android platform. So we've taken Android. Uh, it's still on Android under the cover. You can still install any Android app on it. Um, but we've tailored it. We've customized it for the K-12 classroom. Our sense is that out of the box, tablets today, iPads, etc., grids of apps are not necessarily a great fit for what actually needs to go on in and out of the classroom uh, to do academic work. So this tablet, when you turn it on for the first time, and I'm showing you a sneak preview, this is something that we're piloting right now, several districts uh, in the US, uh, it knows who you are. It knows what courses you're studying. Each of one of those notebooks is representing a course that you're taking. It's already integrated, got that data from the school system. Um, and so the interface is organized around your work, uh, as you can see at the bottom, your, your day at school, uh, and, uh, and it can do that right from day one. If we flip and look at the teacher's side of that, um, then the teacher has a slightly different interface that we've uh, designed. One of the things you, they can see as a class starts, so imagine you're all coming into uh, my class. I, as a teacher, have my tablet. Uh, I can see who um, was absent yesterday, so they may have missed something and need extra help in today's lesson, and I can see who didn't do the homework, which may have been preparation for what we're actually going to do in class. So straight away, I know which of you is going to need uh, a little bit more of my attention and possibly is going to be trouble. I'm watching you. Um, and uh, so then what happens is I start the class, and just by walking into the class, uh, turning on their tablet, kids essentially are for repairing the devices between the teacher and the kids who are physically present, or they could even join the class remotely, obviously. Uh, and so you can see who's arrived at class, and two kids are missing. So essentially what I just did is take attendance, and that's been sent already to the school system. So uh, saving a couple of minutes every single period uh, across the country. So that's one of our uh, focus areas has been, we know teachers buy into this technology when it starts saving them time and making life easier. So that's one of the little ways that we can do that. Um, we can also show them what every student is looking at during the class on their tablet. Um, so another big push for us is to help classroom management work in a, in a classroom where teachers worry that kids could be doing anything on these tablets. So I can see, and I can see one of the students here is playing Angry Birds. That probably not, that's probably not on task behavior, so I can I can call them out, and you can see pretty quickly students get the idea that they're in class and so they're sort of within the force field that the teachers created for that 45 minute period or, or whatever it is. Um, here's how the content appears. So we've also created tools to help any teacher create really high impact content. So adding images and videos and great learning objects to the content that they already have. Um, and bringing it into a world where it's going to be a lot more engaging for their students. So instead of paper worksheets and, uh, and tests, uh, we, we've put all of that onto the tablet, so it's now interactive. And here on the left is actually a playlist uh, that the teacher has prepared ahead of class for what they're actually going to do during, during this class, and uh, I'm going to choose to send this quiz to kids. So here's the kids view, they see the same as the teacher. Um, that quiz just arrived and then I would take that on the device itself. All of that data is being fed back in real time to the teacher and of course back to the, to the map I just showed you. So it's all, uh, even in-class quizzes, as long as it's aligned with the Common Core Standards, is actually um, helping teachers understand what a kid is ready for next. 
Uh, and you can also see the little lock, the padlock there, is showing us that we've actually locked down the tablet so you can't cheat. It's an option the teacher could set, because maybe the right thing is to allow students to go and research these answers, but, uh, but they can have that choice. And another control uh, is teacher hits one button and it actually locks every device. Um, so we've been doing a lot of thinking and piloting uh, for, for those kind of um, functions. There's also a lot of content that we preload on these devices. So as Joel said, we're not just selling you a tablet. It's a tablet, it's got customized software, uh, and it's got, it's got content from these partners, uh, which we're very excited about. Khan Academy is preloaded, CK12, which is open source uh, textbooks, Encyclopedia Britannica, and some others. And this is a, a list that we're adding to. And since it's preloaded, that might seem like a small deal, but actually, um, for school bandwidth, that's a big deal. If everyone's going to start streaming videos during class, for a lot of schools across the country, that's just going to bring down the infrastructure. So, so we've been smart about preloading. Um, again, we can do that based on the profile of the kid and the data. So that's Amplify Access. And then the third piece, which you don't have to learn in place, we'll do the third piece is learning. So what we've shown you now is building on a map of data and analytics that enables you to get smarter and customized on a learning platform that's optimized, we believe, for the schools and that contains basic content. Then the third piece is a curriculum we're developing from K to 12 in math, science, and English language arts, all aligned with the new Common Core, which, as I said, is going to hit 45 out of 50 states in 2014. And so now I'd like Lawrence to just demo for you some of the kind of curriculum that we're developing to give you a sense of a different delivery system, one that integrates home, school, gets the kid to see this platform as a place where really learning can, can integrate and gives the teacher an extended day, extended year type of opportunity that we think has never existed before. Thanks, Joel. So this is Amplify Learning. I'm going to give you a sneak preview of the science curriculum that we're working on. So the first thing we've done is to take the next generation science standards, which is the new standards, emerging standards for science, and break them into problems and questions that kids get interested in. We believe that when a student has a uh, puzzle or a challenge in front of them, they're much more engaged in the learning and, and they're pulling rather than the teacher is pushing. So that's what we've done across science. And in this case, we've built a little animated movie of, uh, this is a 16th century doctor uh, called Sanctorius, who identified that um, something happens even when he's just resting, he loses weight. Something going on with breathing. So what is happening when I breathe? Uh, he actually died before he solved the problem, so now you as seventh graders are inheriting this scientific problem of why do we breathe? And you're still uh, at home, so this is pre-class, um, and so uh, the next thing that we give you is a simulation. So we've been building these uh, authentic models and simulations just like real scientists use. Um, this one obviously simplified for middle school. Uh, and in this case, it's the human body. So we're showing you the respiratory system and the circulatory system, and you can actually interact with it. So you're not watching a movie now. You are uh, changing the, um, you're feeding the patient. We call him Slim, is our model. And uh, the simulation will run. Uh, you can have him run, uh, do activity, and start to see what happens. Now you're ready for class. And so when you arrive in class, remember, everything that you've done so far has generated data. That data has flowed to the teacher. So the teacher would be able to make some decisions that uh, result in giving different groups of kids slightly different problems. So here, you're now going to be put into a team. And, the, and you get a letter from, from a peer uh, with a problem to solve. And you're going to now go and research that. And so uh, we give you a set of tools to, um, you're going to be reading, and, and reading and writing are a big part of the new science standards, not just the English language art standards. So we want students to be reading scientific material, they're getting, practicing the skills of asking questions and identifying evidence, 
uh, and all of that's happening in this custom e-reader environment. And then perhaps the team uh, unlocks when they're ready, when they've done sufficient pre-work, this uh, lifelike simulation, um, previously sort of only, only available to scientists, but um, here what we're actually doing now is flying into the body and into lungs, and it's gonna take us right down to uh, the molecular level. So extremely detailed um, simulation that kids can use to start to understand. This is actually where um, oxygen molecules start to pass into the bloodstream, so it's the moment for some kids where they understand how those two systems fit together. Now I'm ready to make my diagnosis, uh, and again, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be asked to do that in the simulation. Uh, so we're taking you through a sort of differential diagnosis process. Um, and then finally, I will, I'll actually write that. That's my homework. Um, and I'll, I'll submit that. So to the question earlier on about creation versus um, consumption on devices, we already have in schools um, pilots where kids are quite happily uh, doing their homework and typing um, actually on the device, which has the advantage that the teacher gets it straight away and can give uh, feedback. So that I'm done, except um, we wanted to give kids opportunities to go further. And in, in this case, um, what we've done is work with some of the leading game developers to create games. And educational games have a, have a, a check in history. Some of them are, kids can tell when something is not really a game or it's a bad game. And so we have been trying really hard to create these and play testing them with kids uh, nonstop. And you can see here, what I'm doing is actually operating the body, and if I succeed, then I get to the next level, where I actually get to uh, do the same thing in a plant. So I'm learning about photosynthesis, uh, and even though we haven't actually touched that yet on the, uh, on the syllabus, it's coming up later. So I'm, I'm getting ready for what comes next. Uh, and that, then, is my homework. We think we might have to come up with a new word for homework, because uh, it's too much fun. Thank you. So that's essentially one team's vision of really a transformative play in K-12. And I know so many of you out there are working in this space, and so if I can step aside from Amplify and as a former school chancellor say, this is really some of the most important work we can do as a nation, because if we don't transform K-12, to then we're gonna be looking at a problem down the road of kids who are massively underprepared or unprepared for what the 21st century global economy will demand. So, those of you in the space, I thank you, and I look forward to a time two, three years from now when we can genuinely say that K-12 education looks very different from the way it looked when I grew up in 1950. Thank you.